let's go live. Thank you for everyone for joining us for the Transport to Table Climate Change Forum tonight. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the judicial owners of the land on which we meet today. I'd like also to pay respects to my elders past and present. So just some general um, housekeeping for tonight is just to let everyone know that the forum will be live streamed on Facebook and recorded. Um, please keep your mic on mute. And if you have any questions, please run to the chat box and we'll have a Q&A at the end of the session. There'll be a few speakers today, so ensure that to ensure we keep on time, Claudia will be our timekeeper today and she will keep the speakers on track. If you have any tech issues, please send Claudia a message. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jackie Yong from the Benigo Sustainability Group. The group brings together people together with shared interest in sustainable living in Bendigo. We invite and welcome the growing community that take, that's taking individual and collective action to improve the future of Bendigo. So my sustainability journey began over 10 years ago. And it was a period where we're experiencing the drought. We had water restrictions and we also had Black Saturday. I was running a salon back then and there was a lot of conversations around climate change. And I wanted to be part of that solution in com combating climate change. So I began at looking at the waste that was being generated at the salon. I started to learn about the waste and realised how much I didn't know, especially where waste was going. I thought the rubbish ferry just took it away and it disappeared. What I actually had learnt was where it made me realise I wanted to make a difference. So I made some changes in the salon and explored how I could reuse one of the biggest contributors to my bin, which was hair. That journey of collecting, experimenting and researching the beneficial uses of hair led me to start one of the largest organic recycling facilities in Victoria. The change from living in an ur urban setting and then living and running business in rural Victoria was a massive eye-opener. I learned there was such a great divide between urban, regional and rural cities. I also realised that as a city dweller, I've been completely disengaged from where my food had come from and I don't mean the local supermarket or the fridge. So when I moved to a town two and a half hours from Melbourne, I truly understood the impact of climate change. That year I moved out, moved up to the town. They were still experiencing one of the worst droughts. I recall hearing the number of farmers who had taken the stock to local sale yards and then went home to take their lives. The following year bore down with one of the worst floods once again they've ever seen. And this created another challenge for the farming community. I was having conversations with the farmers about their concerns for the future. They could see how much they had to change their farming practices if they were to continue farming in the future. I recall having to request a bore sample for the facility. What came back was a shock to the system. The bore sample was taken 12 metres below ground level. The salinity of the water result was higher than that of sea water. Wow, climate change was real. So I'm really grateful to, to be here today and I'm really looking forward to hear from our speakers so that I can learn about the issues and how I can contribute to my transport footprint. Claudia from Friend of the Earth will give you a bit of context for this event. Thanks, Claudia. Thanks so much, Jackie. And yeah, thank you so much for being our MC today. So, I guess I wanted to just give a bit of an overview of why we're here today and um, what is Sustainable Cities, this campaign that I work on and why we decided to bring together these groups from both Bendigo and Melbourne. So Sustainable Cities is a collective that's run through Friends of the Earth and we're working towards creating a more connected city with safe, accessible and sustainable public transport for everyone. So we're wanting to move um, money away from big polluting toll roads and towards sustainable public transport and active transport. I think it's really clear this year, especially in the face of COVID-19 and climate change, we've seen bushfires earlier in the year, that we do need to be creating more resilient cities. And that means 
healthier people who are moving more. And it also means, you know, having public transport that works for everyone. That's also reducing emissions as well. So we decided to um, bring together groups from both Bendigo and Melbourne um, to kind of bre break down that um, that rural versus city kind of agenda that has happened a bit of a push and pull between um, between those two areas when it comes to public transport. So we really wanted to create those connections and build a movement of different groups that are all fighting towards the same thing, which is more sustainable, a more sustainable future and also uh, more sustainable transport. So we have had some really good news this week in terms of transport infrastructure, which has been awesome. In the budget, we got 5 billion in transport, um, in money towards public transport, which is fantastic. Um, so that's for the suburban rail loop, 100 new trams, and also zero emissions buses, which is really fantastic. But we still have a lot of work to do. We've got still got $16 billion going towards the North East Link toll road, which is going to lock our city into a future of car dependency and, um, and contribute more to emissions. And we also have $7 billion being spent on the Westgate Tunnel at the moment. So we really want to make sure that um, we're showing, sending a strong message to transport ministers and decision makers um, including Jacinta Allen, who um, is in the seat of Bendigo, that we, we're we working together and people really do care about um, creating more resilient cities and working towards sustainable transport for everyone. So I did send around in the confirmation email that we're going to be doing a little bit of an action. So if everyone can get a pen and a paper ready for a little bit later, we're going to be taking a group photo with the message sustainable transport and the hashtag get on board Vic. So we'll post um, that message in the chat as well. So you'll be able to um, make your own version of this, even if it just says sustainable transport. And then halfway through the event, we'll take a screenshot. So get ready in between and grab your pen and paper and make your own little sign and we'll take a screenshot. But um, I'll hand it back over to Jackie now. And um, thank you so much. Thank you, Claudia, and thank you for your passion and leadership in this field. Um, really pleased to hear that people are bringing together you know, regional and city in the same context, so thank you. So first I'd like to introduce our first ex our guest speaker, which is Dr Crystal Legacy. She's a senior lecturer in urban planning at the Melbourne University. Dr Crystal Legacy is a senior lecturer in urban planning at the University of Melbourne where she's also the Deputy Director of the Informal Urbanism Research Hub. As a former recipient of an Australian Research Council Fellowship, Crystal has published wide, widely on the topics of urban transport, strategic planning and urban policy. Her current research examines the governance and policy changes of planning future urban transport and the politics of citizen participation in infrastructure planning. Thank you, Jackie, for that introduction. And thank you, Claudia, for the invitation uh, to take part in this forum. I'm very excited to he be here. Uh, first, let me acknowledge that I am I'm sitting on, uh, on land that's been stolen, um, but the custodians of the land is, are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Transport is always contested, and I like to use that acknowledgement to remind myself that we that the very politics upon which we uh, uh, reside and and find ourselves is very present in how we think about transport and transport planning. Now, like many of you, um, I'm a cyclist. Um, I I don't drive, I, although I do have a driver's license, and I have become increasingly concerned about the volume of traffic on our roads and the level of aggression. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone. If I were to say to you and share with you right now that I have been raised by a car more recently, I'm sure there'll be others in this community who have had such a, a similar experience. Now, I speak at these forums fairly regularly, and so I was trying to think of something out, something new to say. I know we are um, a collection, a collective of individuals who are incredibly concerned about climate change 
um, who are concerned about the increasing volume of traffic on our streets and that with, with COVID restrictions in place for the foreseeable future, um, that we might be perpetuating automobility and, and car-based dependency on our roads. So trying to think about what I can say to you that's different, uh, to something that perhaps you haven't heard yet, um, brought me into uh, a bit of a reflective uh, practice. And I was trying to think of well, what are some of the key words that come to mind when thinking about sustainable and active transport around COVID? And some of the words that came to mind are, are, are these, kinder. I want to live in a kinder city. The kind of experience I've had on the roads recently as a cyclist and a pedestrian really brings that to the fore because I don't think we're all that kind to each other on our public roads. Public, I use that word deliberately. Patience, another word that I think we are well and truly in need of um, in this current moment we find ourselves. Aware, aware of each other, aware of vulnerable road users and I just want to acknowledge that we have lost important members of our community on our roads very recently who deliver food for us. So we want awareness, awareness of the vulnerability. Empathy, empathy for, for each other's needs. And of course three words that are, no, are very familiar to the folks in this room, um, sustainability, livability, and climate justice. So thinking about creating a city that is just for everyone. Now, one of the questions that uh, sits at the forefront of my mind when thinking about sustainable transport is for whom are we planning sustainable transport? Um, who gets to decide what is sustainable? What counts in the discussion around sustainability? And even though, even us in this room, we have a degree of privilege that we need to acknowledge and reflect on. So when we talk about sustainability, who is missing from those conversations and those wider debates? And how can we bring them in? Sitting alongside that very question is a commitment I think we all need to make towards decolonizing transport planning. This is something that demands attention. It demands critical engagement, critical reflection, and it's something that we all have to do a bit of work around. Even the most progressive amongst us in this room today need to do that work. So that's my challenge to you. And I want to maybe return to this as we have our discussions over the, ne over the, la over the next hour around sustainable transport and how we can check ourselves in terms of how we might decolonize the way in which we even think about what counts in the conversations around sustainable transport. The last thing I want to say is, um, is, is, to, is to introduce this word reframing. I think we need to do a lot of work to reframe how we discuss and how we think about the allocation of road space, who gets to make those decisions and why, and what knowledge informs that allocation and why. Um, and, and, and thinking about reframing is really, really important. Yes, we can go out and we can create pop-up bike lanes. We can celebrate budgets like we've seen this week from the state government, but there is a lot of work still to be done in terms of reframing how we have the conversation about transport planning and its provision. Just very quickly thinking about how Tim Pellis is talking about electric vehicles is very, very interesting. That when we talk about, when he introduced this idea that we are going to expand electric vehicles, that we are going to charge them to have access to the road. And that this is something that we're going to phase in and introduce is road congestion. Now this, uh, this demands a really, this uh, raises a really important question for us around the privatization, commodification, and commercialization of what is, should be public space, and that is public roads. This is something that we need to, we need to interrogate and we need to challenge, uh, particularly in the policy space, um, because this is the reframing work that we need to do. And what a moment to start that reframing work, but in a pandemic, where everything's up for grab. What was once seen to be impossible is now possible. And we can very much um, challenge ourselves and very much so the advocacy transport community in these discussions. So I'll leave it there because I'm very interested in hearing what everyone else has to say. Thank you very much, Crystal. 
I liked how you spoke about um, public behaviour and how much we have, we're seeking to be kinder and more patient and have more awareness and empathy. Absolutely, I really appreciate you talking about that. And also enjoyed you talk about reframing and how we have those conversations with the, um, you know, privatisation of public roads. I think we've made a mistake once, we don't want to go back there again, do we? <laughs> Thank you. So let me introduce to you now is Trevor Budge, former manager of regional sustainable development at the city of Greater Bendigo. Trevor Budge was a recent manager of regional, regional sustainable development at the city of Greater Bendigo until his retirement in mid November 2020. He is a ministerial appointee on the board of the Victorian Planning Authority. He has been an associate professor in the Community Planning and Development Program at La Trobe University, Bendigo Camp Campus, and an adjunct professor at RMIT University. He was state president of the Planning Institute of Australia for three years and has a Lifetime Achievement Award in his Life Fellow of the Institute. He played a leading role in the Institute's seven-year post-tsunami reconstruction program in Sri Lanka and is a visiting professor at the University of Marotoa in Sri Lanka. He was founding board member of Victoria Walks, an organisation established by Big Health dedicated to promoting walking as the healthiest, most sustainable and least infrastructure demanding mode of transport. He believed he served on the board for nine years. He's, he was a ministerial appointee on Victoria Catchment Authority Council for six years. He has worked for state, regional and local planning authorities and conducted his own consulting business for 16 years, focusing on rural and regional Victoria. In 2011, he was awarded an Order of Australia AM for services to town planning, particularly in rural and regional Victoria and for education. I love you quote, Trevor. Active transport, which includes public transport, is the future for our planet, for cities and for neighbourhoods, for our health and above all, our building, our building our communities. Thanks very much, Jackie. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. And yes, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, I'm on Jar Jar Rung country and uh, give pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I recognise that the land has never been ceded. I wanted to focus on three things in my talk. One is that, if we look at it closely and we look at it uh, optimistically, all the legislation is in place to achieve what we want to achieve. We just have to implement it. Secondly, that there is, there is enormous value in advocacy. I know that a lot of people probably on this um, Zoom meeting are frustrated by the lack of progress. But in actual fact, I want to give you some examples of where advocacy works. And the last thing is, um, I want to talk about the value of not caving into bureaucrats. So, um, first of all, the legislation exists. Many of you will know this, but we, if you look at the legislation that exists in Victoria at the moment, uh, whether you talk about the Planning Environment Act, um, whether we talk about the new Local Government Act, which makes it mandatory for local governments to address climate change, or whether you look at the 2010 Transport Integration Act, um, the legislative framework, and with, with lots of other legislation, it's all there in place. What we need to do is to make sure that uh, our members of parliament and that our community organisations uh, are constantly aware of this and are advocating around this. This is not something that has to be introduced to change things. If you look at the Transport Integration Act, it starts with a premise that we have to not only integrate transport and land use, but it has to be done in such a way that's environmentally sustainable. Now, um, you know, people might say, oh, legislation, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of words, doesn't mean much. Um, there's nothing like quoting back to a government the very legislation that they passed uh, and holding them accountable for implementation. We can come back to that topic and people might want to explore it, but uh, I... I just emphasise that if you haven't read the Transport Integration Act, read the first, it's 385 pages, but if you, if you read the first few pages after the definitions, um, you'll see the framework exists. The second thing I wanted to talk about was the idea 
of the value of advocacy. And I want to, I want to give you a couple of examples. They're from some time ago, but they show you what happens. Uh, in about 1977, I was working for an organisation which was looking at transport across the region. And what we did was we advocated that the speed limit in the township of Malden should be reduced to 40 kilometres an hour. Now, this doesn't sound radical in current terms, but it was radical then. It was so radical that the regional director of what was then the Country Roads Board, which is now Vic Roads, uh, demanded, absolutely demanded, uh, that it be taken out of the report. In his words, no road in Victoria will ever have a 40 kilometre hour speed limit. Now, um, that person actually is still alive. Um, no doubt he's um, observing the speed limits every time he goes past a school, every time he goes through the centre of a town, and every time he drives through the centre of Bendigo. Absolute indication that advocacy uh, ultimately will beat our bureaucrats. Can I give you two other examples? In about 2010, I was working on a project. We were advocating that the newly um, opened Maryborough to Ballarat railway line, that the, the station, there should be a station opened at Clunes. Uh, in a report that we put out, it, we, it was demanded of us that we take out the reference to a Clunes railway station. In the words of the senior bureaucrat in the Department of Transport in the, the region, there will never ever be a railway station at Clunes. The very next day, Premier Brumby announced the railway station would be opened at Clunes. Um, what I'm trying to say here is do not be deterred by what you get as answers from the bureaucrats. The political process is very different to what many bureaucrats are doing. Can I also give you the example, a Bendigo example. In 2008, the city of Greater Bendigo advocated that there should be a railway station developed at Huntley. Our local Bendigo community will know where I'm talking about. Uh, the Department of Transport advocated that we need to, you will not produce that report with that station. We are absolutely objecting to it. There should be no reference. There is no budget. No allocation has ever been made. Even as late as 2014, we were told by Department of Transport, there will never be a railway station at Huntley. So what happened at the 2018 election? Uh, Minister Allen announced there will be a railway station at Huntley. I think you're getting the message of what I'm saying here, is that advocacy beats um, bureaucrats every time if you if you put something in a plan and you keep persisting with that plan and it makes sense in actual fact what happens is that politicians are looking for things to do to announce to advocate for to to put into an election platform to announce with a budget if you put things in a plan you give them hope you give them a a, a hook and this is what we did with the integrated transport land use strategy in Bendigo. We talked about a Bendigo metro rail. And so what happened at the, at the 2014 election, state election, um, here was an announcement about we'll implement Bendigo metro rail. Can I finish with um, another comment? And one of the things that, and I don't want to sound like I'm engineer bashing here, but one of the issues with engineers is that uh, they basically address a problem in terms of the way in which it's put to them. I once uh, had a long meeting with uh, the mayor of Portland, Oregon. If you know anything about Portland, Oregon, you'll know that they're really, you know, um, uh, innovative transport based on sustainable development. Their, their approach, where, where would you put a new light rail? Their, his answer was, um, show me the city that's before, show me the part of the city that's performing the worst. Show me the most rundown area in the city. That's where I'll put the, the light rail, which is a contrast to the way in which many other people think. But this guy was a former engineer. And I was talking to him about engineers and he said, the problem with engineers is we ask them the wrong question. So if you ask a group of engineers, you say, we've got a road that's congested between A and B. How can we fix it? They'll, put, they'll say, well, we need to build another lane. And we all, say, we all know from induced traffic studies that all that's going to do is is fill up the, the road system. He said, ask them the right question. Ask them the question, 
we need to reduce the traffic volumes every year by 3%. Not, which is the normal question, we've got 3% growth in traffic volumes, how can we accommodate it? Ask them the question, how can we reduce the traffic volumes by 3% every year? He said, you'll actually get an answer which will say, oh, perhaps we could, we could look at uh, a, a smart bus system. Perhaps we could look at um, uh, uh, encouraging people to put two people in a car instead of one person in a car. He said, if you ask the right question, you'll actually get sensible answers out of engineers. Let's start asking engineers the right questions when they start to address transport issues, particularly road. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you, Trevor. Um, I'm actually going to have a look at the Transport Integration Act. Never knew it existed. So I've learned something um, tonight. And I'd like to also thank you for your support and encouragement and show that advocacy can make a difference. And I think what's really great about tonight is that we've all come here together looking for a solution and with your perspective and experience and our approach, we can actually get those outcomes. So thank you, Trevor. Our next guest speaker is Chris Core. Chris is the Vice President and Infrastructure Coordinator of Bike Bendigo. Chris Core is a long-time volunteer with Bike Bendigo and the Bendigo Sustainability Group, where he's a project manager of the Community Power Hub Bendigo project, working on renewable energy projects and promotions of electric vehicles. Chris is a civil engineer with 22 years experience in project management and consulting in the water and environment industries, including past roles with GHD and Colburn Water. Chris also works as project manager engineering at the Northern Central Catchment Authority. With Bike Bendigo, Chris works with local and state government to lobby for, review, design and seek funding for protected and separated cycling infrastructure for Bendigo and Central Victoria. It is Chris' goal that those from eight to 80 can ride comfortably and safely for everyday transport. Thanks, Chris. All right, thanks very much for that, Jackie. Um, and thanks very much, uh, Claudia and the Friends of the Earth uh, for hosting this event and coordinating with both Bike Bendigo and uh, the Bendigo Sustainability Group. Uh, it's been wonderful to hear from um, both Trevor and, and Crystal already um, and getting these fantastic insights and certainly so many of those are ringing true. Um, I do have a presentation I'll just uh, share here and we're also gonna hear um, this evening from Nicola uh, Dunnicliffe-Wells is the president of, of Bike Bendigo. So there will be a number of overlaps, um, I guess, or further you know, aspects of, of what um, you know, Bike Bendigo does as well. I guess just in the, in the context of, um, you know, of, the, of this forum and, and the effects of transport on climate change, um, you know, DELP and CSIRO you know, clearly says that we've got you know, maximum and minimum daily temperatures increasing, uh, you know, up to almost 2%. Um, you know, expected in by even by the 2030s, you know, rainfall will re reduce and come at different times and in more extreme weather events. And we'll certainly be heading for a, you know, a, a climate, um, you know, very similar to uh, to Shepherd and, and and then worse into the future. So so we need to make those emission reductions and we need to manage our health and, and manage the, the heating and the climate. I guess in addressing the climate change and what we can do in active travel and what we can do in transport, uh, you know, we need to get people using active travel and get them out of their cars you know, for at least some of the trips. Um, we're not, not, it doesn't have to be a wholesale change. It's not all or nothing. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a progression. Uh, and we need, as we've already heard, we need to return you know, more public space and, and public road space at present to the people for you know, many high value uses, um, you know, including the likes of active travel, um, certainly for walking and cycling, um, greening you know, plants and, and cool surfaces um, to, I guess, to partly offset and reduce the, the impacts of a, a warming climate um, and our heating planet. Um, and also people orientated spaces, you know, parks, dining, recreation, those sorts of things. And it's actually all these things that are actually uh, are being kicked along by, by COVID now and our need to socially distance and those sorts of things. Also the use of um, you know, shared and electric vehicles, um, EVs, is you know, to supplement active travel. So again, it's not all or nothing. You know, the average motor vehicle sits idle 97% of the time. It's an extraordinarily inefficient vehicle. It's an extraordinarily expensive vehicle for all of us, um, including myself who own private vehicles. You know, we need to be able to share those, reduce the costs, you know, make them electric, so reduce the impact um, on climate and in the environment, 
and actually, and, and more so, and more importantly, get the space back in our urban cities um, to actually use for these other purposes, including active travel. In addressing climate change, uh, you know, our, our vehicles, you know, many different sorts of electric vehicles, bikes, scooters, cars, buses, trucks, um, you know, all of those will be integrated into our, you know, into our electricity network um, and be far more green and sustainable as our, uh, as our electricity grid, you know, particularly becomes more and more, um, you know, powered by, you know, by renewable energy and particularly community-owned renewable energy, you know, as, as the BSG certainly, um, you know, been, been actively looking at. Nicola will talk more about this um, in her presentation, but you know we, we have to get and what we need is um, you know is people comfortable to ride, uh, give them the infrastructure they need, and that's certainly my passion. Um, you know, so that we can get you know some, somewhere 70, 80, 90 percent of the population actually thinking that uh, or knowing that that actually riding a bike for everyday travel, not just on the weekend, not as a recreation source, but for actual offsetting you know, trips. Um, is achievable and can be achieved. And for that, we need you know, separated, protected, um, you know, off-road um, infrastructure, not, not mixing with traffic. At Bike Bendigo, uh, you know, advocacy and the work that we do, um, you know, it's all about you know, connecting um, and linking you know, existing you know, great trail net or you know, good trail network that we do have in Bendigo. We've made some great advances. Um, and, um, you know, and certainly building on the work of the ITLIS strategy that, um, that Trevor mentioned, and also the more recent walking and cycling strategy of the City of Greater Bendigo has developed, um, certainly in partnership with the community and ourselves and others. Um, yeah, and that's what we need to achieve. And, and, and there's an image on, on your screen now of, um, you know, I guess, a, of what we call sort of bike metro or, you know, or the, or the, the loop sort of trails and how you can get in and out of the city centre area and also around Bendigo. But look, it really is a 20 minute ride um, from the outskirts of urban Bendigo to the city centre um, and many, many places are obviously shorter than that. So it is very competitive with car travel if we've got the right infrastructure. At Bike Bendigo, uh, you know, we work regularly um, with Regional Roads Victoria um, and certainly the City of Greater Bendigo, um, both the active travel and the engineering teams, um, which is you know, absolutely fantastic and also um, some working with the Department of Transport um, as well. So. You know, we work on reviewing designs, providing input, um, you know, instigating meetings, discussions, projects, um, you know, concepts. So, you know, it is quite often that we're, I guess, leading the way into new things. So there's advocating that Trevor's talking about. I mean, that's that's what we do. I guess councils are understandably stuck within their budgets and their program that's already within a budget. So when we see a priority and we know there's a priority, I guess we're more adaptable and flexible to be able to really sort of, you know, lobby for it, ask for it jump up and down, whatever it might be, and also go to the, the politicians and others as well to try and get those sorts of things funded to get the great outcomes for Bendigo. We've been working with Regional Roads Victoria on, on say, the Morong Road project, which is um, you know, a seven kilometre uh, you know, major transport project for Bendigo. They're no longer road projects. So this is the Integration Transport Act at its best, you know, saying we've got to move people and things. We don't have to move cars and trucks. Um, and so we've done a lot of work with regional roads and the, and the concept for this and uh, this, these projects are up for, in the mix for funding. Um, you know, the, one of the first stages would be a, a fully separated and protected walking and cycling lane over the full length and some intersection upgrades progressively over time. So it's certainly a, you know, a great outcome. There are two other projects on the east side of Bendigo, uh, Strathfield Say Road and Nippalock Road that are uh, similarly um, you know, having concepts developed by Regional Roads Victoria and again the same sorts of basis. So it's a, a stark difference from a, you know, a short few years ago. Ellis Street Bikeway uh, in, in Central Bendigo, we um, probably reviewed three versions of, uh, of you know, iterations of design um, for the Bendigo's first separate and protected bike lane, which was implemented um, and opened um, in February this year, just as COVID hit and just as the school closed. Um, so, um, so yeah, but it's certainly, it's great to have um, you know, the first separate bikeway in Bendigo, and there are a near map aerial photo of it as well. So um, this is getting a lot of attention, I guess, nationally as well, because it's sort of a cheaper um, you know, project that can be implemented. But certainly plenty of road space in Bendigo. There's lots of connections needed in, in central Bendigo as well, and we're working on those with council and, and with regional roads Victoria. Uh, that's just on the north side of Bendigo. Uh, yeah, we review infrastructure designs, we provide suggestions, and, um, and certainly council and regional roads you know, are very good at taking those on board, be they roundabouts, um, you know, dealing with the issues of, sh of sharrows and, and bike, you know, I guess how bikes integrate and, and work through those. 
I guess though key though is is the missing gaps in what is already a good network. So we've been working um, you know, with council and, uh, and we've worked on a, on a package of, of works, um, some quick works that could be done, um, some missing gaps in the network. And each of the uh, symbols on that map is a, is a, is a I guess a, a gap, you know, trail ends here, trail starts on the other side of the road, busy road, no safe crossing. Um, so that is really limiting the ability for people to use those networks for, for safe and comfortable travel. Um, so filling these missing gaps, uh, you know, 42 that we've identified just in that part, in that part of the network, um, you know, would create jobs short and medium term, um, you know, and, and would make a huge difference to people being able to ride around Bendigo for uh, everyday travel. Uh, big build project in Bendigo, Central Bendigo, um, is happening. 250 million being spent in that area. Huge opportunities um, for walking and cycling. And I think Nicola will talk more about that. And that's literally there in the centre of Bendigo. So it's a great opportunity to actually get government to fund um, the key separated protected bike lanes through the heart of Bendigo, which actually will link up a number of those trails that I showed, which is some you know, big missing gaps at the moment. Working on allocation of space, um, you know, and walking versus footpaths. I mean, we really need bikeways to be actually able to get somewhere fast, safely, um, you know, not conflicting with dogs, elderly kids, you know, these sorts of things, uh, if it's going to be a viable transport option. So, so thanks very much, Jackie. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I love how much you contribute to Bendigo and imports with climate change. Um, and really, really like that data that from Dwelt about regarding climate change. I think it's with that data that we actually we visually see what's happening in our local environment. And fast, fantastic. And I love the idea of you know what really got me was I didn't realise that my car sat idle for ninety seven percent of the time. That is huge. Can't believe I pay so much for my car. <laughs> And it's great to see that Bendigo has got lots of little projects in the background and from personal experience and coming from Melbourne to Bendigo, there are great bike paths here, um, especially along the tracks and it's been a great opportunity to ride on them and know that there's no dogs running out at me or cars coming to veering towards me. So thank you, Chris. Um, now we're actually going to, I'm going to hand you over to Claudia for a quick photo opportunity action. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, so I hope everyone has had a chance to grab a pen and paper. The aim of this is for everyone to turn on your um, turn on your screens so we can see all your awesome faces. Oh, it's so nice to see everyone. I feel like I'm in a real room. <laughs> um, so we are writing on our piece of paper, if you haven't already, sustainable transport. Or if you haven't, oh, someone's even done it as their background. That's pretty cool. Good one, Colin. Um, and if you haven't, uh, and we'd love to see your faces as well if possible. And if you haven't made a little poster, that's totally fine. You can just wave your hands or something like that. Um, awesome. So hopefully we'll be able to see everyone in a second. Um, Will, we need your screen on. And Ian, we need your screen on. And then we'll get a fantastic photo. Alrighty, I'm going to hold up my one too. And I'm going to try and also take a screenshot at the same time, which is a huge skill. All right, on the count of three. One, two, three. Sustainable transport. Woo! -hoo! Ah! I think that worked. Hang on, let me just try. All right, we're going to do a backup one on the count of three. One, two, three. Smile. Woo, so good. Um, so I'll be sharing that on um, on the social medias, and if you'd like to, you can do you can do so as well with a selfie. Um, but I'll send around the um, the group photo in an email, um, and we'll also be tagging just into Alan as well, so that she knows that folks from all across Victoria are very keen on sustainable public transport. Um, good one. So. Uh, without further ado, I'll pass it back to Jackie to introduce the next speaker. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Claudia. That was lots of fun. <laughs> now, I'd like to introduce Nicola Dunnicliffe Wells, who is the president of Bike Bendigo. Nicola has been passionate about promoting riding for transport for more than 20 years. With her team at Bike Bendigo, Nicola is working to make it easier for people to go on bikes, everyday trips. She firmly believes 
that more people riding for short trips will lead to safer climate, a more livable city and a healthier, happier and more connected community. Over the years, Nicola has written Lonely Planet Cycling Guide, been editor of Ride On magazine and developed riding skill workshops, which she has taught in Melbourne, Bendigo and Castlemaine. Encouraging and supporting active travel to school is a particular interest. She has delivered a classroom based active travel program in primary school and has recently started teaching on road cycling skills to teens and tweens. And I love Nicholas' quote More people riding for short trips will lead to a safer climate, a more livable city, and a healthier, happier, and more connected community. Couldn't agree more. Thanks, Nicola. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie, and um, thanks to Sustainable Cities for the opportunity to speak. Oh, I'm just going to start the slides. Um, so, um, firstly, I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, Jajarung people, the land on of whom I'm sitting today, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, so Bike Bendigo is a community organisation. We're committed to everyday cycling. We're working towards widespread community acceptance of riding as a normal and regularly used mode of transport. Cycling is popular in Bendigo, but it's more likely to be this or this rather than this. Riding for transport is growing, but here's the thing. It is really easy to drive and park. So to compete with our strong car culture, riding for transport needs to be easy. It needs to feel safe. It needs to be attractive and convenient. It needs to be as easy and pleasant as driving. I've just realised, Nicola, I don't think your slides are on. Oh, okay. Sorry. I don't know if I, maybe I didn't share. Hold on a second. I just need to share my screen. So, um, here we go. Sorry about that, everybody. Got too carried away. Um, okay. I'll just go back um, and show you those pictures of what we're more likely to see in Bendigo is this, this, rather than this. Um, so uh, we know from research here in Bendigo and elsewhere that the vast majority of people are not comfortable riding when they have to interact with cars. It's clear that to encourage riding for transport, people need to be able to ride where they need to get to without mixing with traffic. Um, Bike Bendigo, as Chris mentioned, we are really fortunate to have good relationships with both the City of Greater Bendigo and the Department of Transport. Um, so we can be part of the conversation. And this is really important because the people who design and build cycling infrastructure don't necessarily ride themselves. We really value the mutual respect, curiosity and trust in our relationships with these organisations because all parties learn from the conversations. Bike Bendigo offers insights about people's experience and perceptions while riding and we gain some understanding of the constraints and the systems that those planning, designing, budgeting for and building infrastructure work within. Um, I'd just like to share some uh, examples of the benefits. So cycling infrastructure is often designed around who's already using it, not the people who don't yet ride because they don't feel safe. So it's designed for people like this, generally. Um, although less, less now, there's more, there's more separate infrastructure. Um, so in Bendigo, the locations for the annual Super Tuesday count, so that's collecting data about cycling numbers during the morning peak, they're mostly on arterial roads where only that small percentage of people who are comfortable riding with traffic will be counted. But when Bike Bendigo is part of the conversation, we can talk about our experience and we can advocate for the needs of that large group who are interested in riding but concerned about traffic. And our city has benefited, certainly, from some game-changing infrastructure over the last few years. And the numbers of people riding on those routes, this is the McIver Road underpass, which um, removed the need for people to cross a really busy road on a really popular path. Um, so the numbers have really risen on those routes. Uh, a second benefit is that without somebody advocating for active transport, there are opportunities missed. So I'm working with a school at the moment where the main growth area is 
in housing estates across a highway from the school. So I don't know if you, the school is here, this is the Calder Highway, and there's two very new housing estates or fairly new housing estates here where there's a lot of young families whose kids want to go to this school. In uh, there's, so, and a lot of those families are really engaged, they'd like to walk to school, but they're not prepared to let their children cross a highway with a large number of trucks. So in advocating for a crossing supervisor, I've been advised that funding's often only uh, accessible when an accident has occurred. And I think this points to a more systemic issue where support for active transport is reactive, not proactive. Without safe passage across the highway, car dependency is forced upon this young and growing community that lives within walking distance of the school. If we're serious about reducing car use and encouraging active transport, we need to think holistically and strategically. In our car culture, it's so easy for planning decisions to entrench car dependency inadvertently. So when advocates for active transport are part of the conversation, walking and cycling is more likely to be supported because we can highlight the issues um, rather than stymied. So there's no question that enabling infrastructure is critical to encouraging more people to travel actively, but we also need a culture where active travel is considered normal. I've been trying for some time to encourage active travel and I've come to realise that even when people understand the benefits, even though we connect the dots intellectually between driving and carbon emissions, between sitting and health, between active travel and livability, most of us still drive. We're familiar with the reasons. It's too hot, too cold, too far, too dangerous, I haven't got time, I've got too much to carry and so on. Driving seductive because it feels easy and safe and normal. It takes effort to change, but without a culture of riding for transport, when no one we know is doing it, it takes all, all those barriers that we talk about seem much bigger. So in Europe, it's colder and wetter than it is here, and they ride for transport in snow. Plenty of people carried stuff on their bikes, including kids. But if your bike shop doesn't stock panniers, or cargo bikes, it's harder to imagine how you might do it. Many local trips are only 10 or 15 minutes ride, but without ro role models, most people don't see how doable it really is. So how do we make it normal? How can we help people to imagine themselves going by bike? I believe that people are more likely to develop a habit of active transport if they're supported to choose walking and cycling when they need to make transport decisions typically at transition points in their life. So Bike Bendigo began a, a program for teens and tweens that are um, transitioning to high school um, earlier this year. Um, teens can no longer ride on footpaths legally, but most of them don't have very much on-road experience. And so I see many families driving to high school without really thinking about it. So we're supporting them to establish a riding habit from day one. And we're actually currently seeking funding to build on this program um, and engage with school families to try and build a culture within the schools. Early parenthood is another transition point where people set their travel habits. Last year, we focused on young children and families for our annual Bike Palooza Festival. And I'd really love to develop this too into an ongoing program supporting young parents. I think it's particularly important that we empower women who so often make the decisions about transporting children and whose choices will then shape travel behaviour in the next generation. Um, we know women are underrepresented in cycling generally and that planning and engineering are male dominated professions. So this makes it doubly important to include women in those conversations about infrastructure and for women to help lead active travel initiatives. The school the, the school crossing I mentioned earlier is another one of those transition kind of moments, an opportunity to build or kill a culture of active travel. Another opportunity, as Chris mentioned, uh, for Bendigo is the so-called big, big build where the Gov Hub and new law courts are being built on Monday Street and around the corner of the new fire station and TAFE. About a thousand people will be moving into this new Gov Hub building um, when it's, when it's completed and others into the buildings nearby, and they will all be making decisions about how they will travel to this rejuvenated corner of town. The Big Build presents Bendigo with a fantastic opportunity to foster a culture of riding to work or, or walking to work in central Bendigo. And Bike Bendigo is really keen to be part of that conversation to ensure that opportunity is not wasted. 
we're looking for more than just simply ticking boxes on a green travel plan. We've got to get the infrastructure right, but we're also looking for a strong behaviour change campaign as well. We want to see incentives for active travel, support like bike skills training, information, social supports, and a strong and ongoing communications campaign. So there's a, there's a few <laughs> examples of opportunities for us to um, help build a culture of active travel. I think there's many opportunities to make going by bike a real option for more people and to build a culture of active transport. And we're working strategically, strategically to leverage as many of these as we can. And um, I'm probably out of time, so I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. I um, really love your passion and thank you for your commitment in promoting bike riding in Bendigo. We need, you know, without, I feel like without you, we probably wouldn't have all the infrastructure we have around here. And I really love the fact how you're creating opportunity for the community to come together and voice with you how they feel they could get a safe infrastructure so they can actually you know, get on the road and live an active lifestyle. And I really found really fascinating too, that you're talking about changing behaviours and changing your habits. You know, it's just so easy and to become complacent and grabbing the keys, jumping in the car um, and just knowing that you're going in there and talking to the teenagers. So changing that behaviour at, at a younger age, as opposed to at a later age where the habit is ingrained in a deeper level. So thank you. And this brings us to our final um, guest speaker, who is Oscar Hayes. He's a senior strategic planner at the City of Melbourne. Oscar is a senior strategic planner at the City of Melbourne. He played a key role in the development of our transport strategy 2030, including policy and strategy on bikes and walking. He is now working in the team which is delivering the bike and walking improvement as part of City of Melbourne COVID reactivation and recovery plan. And his quote for us is, we need our streets to look, feel and be safe so that everyone can choose to reduce their transport emissions. Thanks, Jackie. Um, and thanks to all the other speakers. Um, those are some great presentations. I think um, that is a, a great um, segue into hopefully some um, cause for optimism. And I'm just going to present today some of the um, Really exciting projects that we've been able to deliver these over the last six months. Um, I'll just share my screen. Okay. Um, cool. So as background to where the city of Melbourne is up to at the moment, um, we were in a very good position when uh, the pandemic hit this year because we had our new transport strategy very recently endorsed in October last year. The strategy had one of the most extensive uh, community consultation uh, programs that councils ever completed. We had nearly 30,000 um, visitors on the, on the engagement platform and it had over 1,800 submissions contribute to this plan. Um, it took about two and a half years from start to finish, from research to finalising all the policies in there. But that put us in a really strong position um, early this year to, to know which projects, when and where we were going to deliver. Um, even, even beyond that, in February this year, Council endorsed our climate action response. And one of the actions in that action plan was to accelerate the delivery of protected bike lanes across the municipality. So that map on, on the um, right hand side there is the 2030 vision for what our network of protected bike lanes will look like. Um, that was a 10 year blue. And um, just got your mic on there, Rob. Um, that was a 10 year plan. We, we then uh, compacted the most important routes into a four year program as part of the climate emergency response. Um, and in response to the um, COVID-19, we were then asked to deliver that within a six to 12 month time frame. So my job's changed a little bit. I'm usually a um, idealistic planner thinking about the long-term future, but I've spent a fair bit of time this year uh, working on delivery uh, with our engineers, um, our dear old engineers who have done a great job to get a lot um, delivered in a very short amount of time. Um, so, oh, sorry, that's not moving, there we go. April, 
uh, this year. It was a pretty um, eerie feeling in the city. PT patronage uh, had dropped around 10%. Uh, public transport is the predominant way that people were getting to the city each day prior to, to COVID. We had close to a million people in the municipality every day. Um, so, you know, I'm sure everyone's seen a whole lot of, of photos like this of empty streets in Melbourne, which was a little bit un, uh, uneasy. Um, pedestrian volumes were down to around 15% as well. And before COVID, 89% of all trips in the central city were made on foot. So pretty dramatic scenes in the city. Um, council then made the decision that, you know, there's, there's been this fear that um, people would not want to return to public transport and that we'd have um, un, un, unbelievable congestion if we didn't do something quickly. And so, um, this year's budget um, allocated a, 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 it almost tripled our bike budget to $10 million to deliver um, 40 kilometres of bike lanes um, this financial year, which was a massive commitment. We, uh, we uh, really had to put our minds to work to figure out how to deliver that. Um, but this map on the right-hand side here shows the program of, of what we're delivering. Uh, it may be a little bit small for people, but the, the, at, the, at its core here, it's all about connecting protected bike routes um, throughout the municipality and pr providing uh, an option for more people to use bikes for transport. It's also about prioritising pedestrians in the little streets in the CBD. So I'll, I'll just, I'm going to go through some photos basically and sh show you some of the things that are going on in the streets in the city. Um, we're seeing some pretty rapid change. Um, this slide has sort of been covered by on others, but Certainly, our, our program is all about, um, you know, providing infrastructure that works for eight to eighty-year-olds. We did our own research, and that this is um, I'm able to share this if anyone's interested. But looking at different infrastructure types, what we've been building in the past versus what's um, outlined in the transport strategy, which are protected, separated bike lanes, which continue all the way to the intersection, not in, not you know unexpectedly ending twenty metres out, and you find yourself in a left turn lane. Um, so that's that's really driven the design thinking behind the new designs. Um, but we've also made some big changes to our delivery approach and the products that we're using. So uh, this is looking down William Street towards Flinders Street, looking south. Um, you can see that the bike lane curb, which has been spiked down on the right hand side here. These curbs uh, were a brand new product that was developed to um, deliver this project. They're manufactured just outside Geelong uh, and they use recycled glass as aggregate, um, which is, um, so it, um, is, is certainly a great outcome in its own right, but it's also really changed the way we install bike lanes. So we're able to um, install them much more quickly. These are brought in and screwed down, so um, which has numerous advantages, one of which is a quicker delivery, um, much lower cost. We're talking between a quarter to a third of the, of, of the cost of what we were building before. But a big advantage for us is, is that we're able to make changes to the design if something isn't quite right, if we make a mistake, or if um, the, you know the, we need to reallocate road space again in the future. Um, so we can shift those curbs around it, um, when we need to in some locations, which we've already been doing. Um, and that does really give us a lot more confidence around um, how quickly we can roll things out. And, and you know we're, not, we're less afraid of making mistakes. So it's all about reallocating road space um, to more efficient vehicles, in this case, bikes. Uh, this is a good example around the Queensbridge S-Bend where we used to have two traffic lanes and now we've got a fully separated bike lane which continues all the way around connecting to the bridge there. Um, and we've reduced it from two traffic lanes to one. Um, I'll see if this works. This just gives you a sense of, oops, hang on. Just gives you a sense of how quickly they can build this now, which is um, really made a big difference for us um, we're able to, the cruise can install about 50 metres per hour. So uh, this is looking down Swanson Street, um, just outside Melbourne Uni. This is an existing bike lane that wasn't protected. You used to get lots of taxis parking in there and uh, it also ended right before the intersection and was a very nice place to ride. Uh, it's a lot more comfortable now. So that's made a big difference on there. Um, I think I've got that slide in there twice. Just going to keep going here. This is a picture of um, just near Peel Street, where we've um, uh, we have so had some challenges to build things so quickly. Um, we certainly aren't able to adjust where the existing curbs are. So this is an example where we've um, lifted the bike lane onto the footpath for a short section there. 
it's not the long-term outcome that we want because obviously our footpaths are super important and an even more efficient mode of transport is pe people walking. Um, but in order to get people clear of trucks like that one, um, that's a this is a short-term solution until we can come back in the future and and, and uh, come up with a, a, a an ultimate design. Um, it's sort of a, a step there. We've also installed uh, reduced the speed limits down from 40 to 20 in all of the little streets, Flinders Lane, Little Collins, Little Burke, and Little Lonsdale in the CBD. And pedestrians legally have right of way over vehicles now in those streets. Um, this is another action in the transport strategy to convert those spaces from um, you know, traffic lanes and, and, and parking to, to pedestrian orientated spaces, but also main, maintain access there for, for deliveries and, and property access, which is, um, it, there's very few examples where we're able to, we have certainly investigated at length where we can make closures and, and, and fully pedestrianise those spaces. But um, this is a short term action that means that um, in, in places where a lot of those footpaths are only about a metre wide, People um, have the space, they can use the road space if they need to. It, it sort of reflects what was already going on in those streets. We already had people crossing the road all over the place and it does help make that safer. Um, having said that, we, there's still a bit of a way to go with those with those streets to, to really make them feel like people um, orientated spaces because you know there's still lots of road looking elements in there, but a big step forward. And then in the last six to eight weeks, um, like, across all of, all of Victoria, um, we've seen parklets popping up all over the place. So that, that is a pretty complimentary place, uh, sorry, project that um, reallocates parking in lots and lots of different locations, um, expanding um, the trading areas for those cafes and supporting their, their recovery. Um, and it's interesting, there's, you know, there's some questions around what that will become in the long term. I think some of, many of them, um, people are already saying, we don't want to change this back. Um, we also have questions around how much uh, public space is being commercialised there, but um, it's, I think broadly that's a step in the right direction and there's some big questions to be solved, but that is going, um, that is pretty positive sort of stuff overall. That's uh, just at the top of Little Burr, um, where we've got that on both sides of the road. Um, and finally, I just thought I'd, this, this is a picture of Exhibition Street, so probably one of the most important um, major links that wasn't uh didn't have a, a bike lane pr previously it was a part-time bike lane which was um pretty pretty dangerous um we're now putting in full-time bike lanes on both sides of the road uh, we're using a lot less uh physical separation on on the on these streets um these bike lanes will be parking protected by parked cars as well and there's smallest sections of, of islands there um, it's a sort of a, a hybrid design similar to um, what we've done on Albert Street years ago and, and, and then getting a bit of a balance between wider parking islands, at, um, separator islands, as well as um, making sure that those that there is some physical separation. So um, that's an exciting project. We are seeing some... Um, really positive trends already. Um, some stats from Monday, public transport across Melbourne was at 30% of the, the pre-COVID, the baseline level. Um, traffic has certainly come back a lot more quickly across metropolitan Melbourne. Arterial traffic volumes were at 89% of the February baseline. That's not quite the case in the central city. Uh, it's a bit of a different story. Uh, the, the traffic volumes on central city arterials is much lower and i think obviously that's largely due to the fact that most people most office workers are still working from home um, but in terms of pedestrians and cyclists um, people are certainly coming back to the city on on last last saturday the pedestrian volumes in the central city were at 65 percent of the baseline so that's that's bounced back pretty quickly which is very positive uh, and they were at 50% on Sunday. So that's that's good news. It's good. People are definitely getting out there. Um, in terms of cycling volumes, we've seen a real uplift in, in uh, volumes on the commuter routes coming into the central city. Uh, so they're up to 61% this week. They were, were even higher a week, week before. They were up around 90%. So we're seeing bikes come back very quickly. Um, and I think as everyone, as we've touched on earlier, um, those are the trips that we really want to support and prioritise because there's a 
fantastic stats around how many uh, around recreational cycling volumes and they they are remaining really high so last week um during a week on recreational trails in melbourne it was at 125 percent and the weekend was at 134 so people are out there and riding um and now we really need to um, support them and encourage them our new infrastructure is part of the part of uh, part of that uh, but we also need to be um putting in place new behavioural programs to help, help people start to ride if they want to and translate that behaviour um, into trips to the central city. Um, we're keeping very close eyes on, on the data of, of, of our new bike lanes, where they're going in. And so from October to November, um, we saw weekday bike volumes. This is sort of a cordon around the central city. They jumped by 260%, so that's very exciting. And the trends that uh, we really want to see is that we're getting a broader range of people using those those routes. So we had um, the number of people under 18 uh, increase threefold, which is which is great off a pretty low base. But it, we'd love to see that keep going. And the proportion of women cycling had increased by 13% between October to November. So some good stats, um, but I think we're just getting started. Um, that's all from me. Thank you, Oscar. That was really interesting. Um, great to see the councils jumping on board and investing um, into the 40 kilometre bike range. I think that allows people to make smarter choices and think about the way they become more active. Um, also, too, I think it was really it was great to hear that you guys were using recycled material for the bike lanes. Um, that's a massive win. And also, how quickly, if, when, you put your mind to work, things can actually be done. Um, I love your stats about how much we've actually improved in our cycling. I thought that was that was amazing stats, and I look forward to actually hear about how much that's actually that will grow in the next six months or twelve months. We will be. We will let you know. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Thanks, Oscar. So we're now just going to open for open to the floor for some questions. Um, so the first question is for Crystal. How have you seen privatisation of mobility spaces during the pandemic? Sorry, how have I seen it? Seen privatisation of mobility spaces during the pandemic? Okay, oh, good question. Thanks. <laughs> I think um, I think the privatisation is a is a trend uh, rather than a COVID specific event. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't speak about what's happened with COVID necessarily, but rather to, to raise the alarm that the way we talk about um, road space and certainly the production of new road space, Northeast Link, Westgate Tunnel, and who knows what's next that the way in which these projects are being delivered are through the hands of private operators. And the, the money that is uh, consumed, the revenue produced, doesn't get reallocated into government coffers to then be redistributed for public purposes. It's going into the, the pockets of shareholders. So people who are on uni super are doing quite well with Transurban. So, so but this is exacerbated by um, wider concerns with respect to um, charging of road space, congestion charging. I'm not saying I'm for or against that, but it's just a, a wider question that we need to return to in terms of what that means for accessibility. Another question though that has been raised with respect to COVID is the expansion of commercial space onto public space. So parklets uh, for cafes. A, uh, I may, I do love my cafes. I love writing in cafes. But that is a, a space that one needs to pay to have access to. So again, it creates another question around accessibility and exclusion in the city for people who don't have uh, that capacity to pay. Um, and so these are questions that we always need to return to. And it goes back to even the city of Melbourne and some of the amazing imagery we saw there. I'm absolutely applauding the work that they are doing. But the, the expansion of um, these commercial spaces into public realm uh, is something that we do need to take into account, especially for people who are most um, vulnerable, including our homeless community and where they go and what happens to them. These are the kinds of questions 
we need to ask for ourselves, particularly in the advocacy community, so that we can see the things that are uncomfortable for us. Thank you, Crystal. I think that's something for us to all to kind of walk away with and have a think and actually, um, you know, think about what's happening and hopefully we can start asking more questions, just like we have. So thank you. So the next question is for Trevor. Trevor, what are the pieces of government legislations which you think are most important for our government to be held accountable towards post-COVID? It's, it's interesting if you reflect on where did all the legislation come from that originally established the idea of planning a city. And they really arose out of um, what was happening in the 19th century uh, in Europe uh, and North America, where we had incredibly crowded cities that had a health problem. Yeah. And, and in fact, the idea of, of undertaking uh, the planning of a city uh, was in fact to address chronic health problems, um, cities that were not designed and, and, or designed in such a way or grew up in such a way that diseases ran rampant. It's ironical that we're back to looking at the same question again, how do we design a city uh, in such a way that uh, it, it works for everyone, but at the same time, it's not, a, uh, it's not causing uh, the spread of a, of a disease. And I, and I don't want to sound a pessimistic note, but in the last 20 years, we've had a number of pandemics. This has been by far the most impactful, but we've had about four or five. The thought that we are going to go for the next 10 or 20 years and not have another pandemic, um, we would be, I would think we would be very lucky. So we need to think about how we design the cities. So coming back to the question, what's the legislation? Um, you know, we've had a we've had a um, uh, a planning environment act in Victoria since 1987, uh, and it's really important. It's called a planning environment act. It's not a planning act. It's a planning environment act. Now, if you picked up on the budget, uh, they actually announced in the budget there's going to be a major review of the planning environment act, uh, and I heard today that uh, it's expected that by about May of next year that the the outline of those changes to the Planning Environment Act will be in a public document because the intention is to try and introduce these into Parliament uh, before the end of next year, certainly early 22. So in actual fact, um, everyone has a chance here to talk about uh, what needs to be in that revised Planning Environment Act. One of the most interesting things that happened um, uh, prior to, I think I'm right in saying the 2014 um, election, we were on the verge of including in the Planning Environment Act that you basically had to consider the health impacts of what you were doing. And that was, mm -hmm. at, that just fell away at the last minute before the election. So there is nothing in the Planning Environment Act that, that actually requires you to consider the health impacts of a development that you're undertaking. I would think that we may be in a situation with a new piece of legislation where we'll be required to think, what are the pandemic implications of the way in which you're planning and designing a city and the way in which you're planning and, and approving developments? So coming back to my theme that, you know, advocacy, uh, over the next 12 months or so, there is a great opportunity to really um, get involved in are shaping the act, which will probably be in existence for the next 20 years. And I just made a passing reference in my presentation to the Local Government Act, which for the first time has a, an explicit requirement for local government to address climate change. That's never been there before. That only came in a few months ago. We've got new councils right across Victoria. Um, great opportunity to ask a council. So how are you addressing that component in the, plan in the Local Government Act? So I think there's some great opportunities as we move forward. Thank you, Trevor, once again, um, for your experience and also your knowledge within the council. Um, I think it is a fantastic time for us to start that conversation, in particularly with the new act coming about next year. Um, so thank you again, and hopefully we can all get together again and talk about how we have these conversations and create a 
positive outcome. So this one is for Chris. Chris, are state and federal grants available to build on or tap into the bike biking infrastructure network? Uh, thanks, Jackie and Christian askers. Um, look, I guess probably not not at the community level. Uh, no, and, and Trevor would be well aware of this, but I guess um, you know, I guess there are certainly grant opportunities from a council or, or Regional Roads Victoria. Um, yeah, I guess sometimes they're project based that they apply for. Obviously there's lots of funding and we do do lots of reviews of funding, particularly for Transport Accident Commission and uh, what's called STRIP as well, which is a, a different uh, version of, of government funding. But again, as, as Nicola said before, you know, to get those sorts of money, it's gotta be a crash history and people have to be hurt and killed. So um, you, you wanna address those spots obviously, but it's a, you, know, you wanna be in a proactive sense as well. So uh, look, look, there is you know, certainly from government, um, I guess sometimes money gets given, be it elections or other stimulus, that, that there's discretion of how our council um, spends that money. And I guess we'd obviously be advocating that uh, we're spending far more, far more money in these sorts of areas that we're talking about rather than uh, more traditional census. Um, and certainly it looks like Bendigo looks for grant opportunities, um, you know, where we're not obviously going to be building anything physical as a bike, as a bike lane, but certainly that we can do studies, we can do consultation, we can do advocacy and, um, uh, and I think the real power of us in, in that space is, and certainly I've had discussions with Trevor in the past, um, you know, the community, and now that Trevor's, after, I guess, uh, yeah, retired from, from those roles and what he said before in his presentation, there's a great um, power of the community to advocate and to apply pressure, yeah, certainly, and, and to, to give government those opportunities and, and those um, you know, positive things they want, and also to advocate within organisations like councils and others they're very big organisations, they're complex, there's competing interests and, and priorities in different areas. So, so I guess, you know, we can play those roles of uh, aligning up, you know, the various, um, the various bits and pieces. And um, yeah, but there, there are great opportunities in those senses. And I guess we, but we need a lot more. And we need, like City of Melbourne's just said, we need a substantial increase, you know, 10, 100 fold in what's actually being provided for, you know, for active travel type to, to make the difference that we need within a, you know, a decade or two. And, and I guess probably just uh, haven't, you know, just like dissected the whole budget from a transport sense. Um, but you no, know, I certainly didn't see much or anything really of any note or any big programs from government, um, despite the huge expenditure, unfortunately, for active travel. But there will be buckets for infrastructure and hopefully this flexibility for councils and uh, others to, to build this sort of thing that we need. Uh, Jackie, can I just comment on that question? Um, and I noticed it's come up in an, in an answer, someone talking about, you know, doing, uh, riding along some of the trails in Melbourne. And I think what we've got there is a really good example is that when they elevated the railway um, between Caulfield and Dandenong and effectively have created a bike path underneath it, um, you know, if you take the total value of the project, creating that bike path underneath the, the rail um, is minuscule in terms of the total value of the project. And yet that has transformed the way in which people can move in those communities. So what I, what I suppose I'm, I'm advocating for is that, you know, when we do these projects, a small allocation which takes into account the needs of pedestrians, the needs of cyclists, can make a huge difference. And they're actually only a fraction of the total cost. Um, so, you know, a $100 million road project is, is not a really big road project. Um, and yet a couple of million dollars out of that to, to allocate for um, a space for people to walk and cycle makes a huge difference, not just to walking and cycling, but it makes, makes a huge difference to the community in those locations. And, and, you know, I know that not everyone's actually enthralled by elevated um, rail, but um, all the fears that were raised originally about those elevated rail systems, um, I think a lot of people have realised they've actually uh, inadvertently created a better environment for themselves by freeing up space underneath them. So there are lots of ways in which we can um, do what Chris is talking about, you know, and create those um, extra infrastructure simply by siphoning off some of the funds from the bigger projects. 
Thank you for your input, Trevor. Appreciate that. So I've got a question for Oscar. How important are those smaller tasks like maintenance for bike paths and other active transport measures? Uh, like maintenance? Um, yeah, I think I think um, what's been very significant this year is that you know the scale of what we're doing here. These are big pieces of the network that are being delivered, um, but um, the smaller things are critically important. I think that the um, the crowd spot, um, the bike spot maps that um, recently came out is an incredibly valuable tool to be able to pick up some of those very small projects that make a really big difference. Um, you know, missing pram ramps that get you up up a curb um, to, to, to a safe spot um, or one that's, we, we have a frustrating standard um, where we have these bull-nosed um, um, curbs and in some locations, uh, there's one on Swanson Street in Melbourne Uni as an example. So those tiny little things, um, it only that can be the thing that that turns for people off riding if you you go to take a left turn and 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 slip over. Um, yeah, you know, you're you're off your bike for three months and then you don't want to get back on. So um, the tiny those small things are, are are huge. And I think yeah, we need we need the the big projects and the small projects. And I think um, it's it's very exciting that we've made so much project progress on the big things, but um, we are certainly doing a lot of planning for uh, next financial year at the moment, and and there is a real focus on on smaller things. Um, the other thing that is very challenging for us is um, changes to signals at intersections. So we've done a lot of space reallocation, but we uh, we really need to do a huge amount of time reallocation. Um, this is very pertinent for um, pedestrians in the central city um, around and particularly in the context of supporting social distancing. Um, most of the overcrowding on our footpaths is caused by long delays at traffic signals. So, And that's because our signals in the CBD were programmed in the 80s and they haven't really changed since. So um, to, to reduce that congestion, there's a lot of places where there isn't any more space to, to provide. If, if, you know, there's streets where we've already got the traffic down to one lane, which is um, sort of the vision in the transport strategy that each street in the huddle grid will be one lane in each direction. Um, but there's still not enough space. So we need to do um, more with how the signals are operating to give people more frequent opportunities to cross the road. And, and that's becoming, you know, more and more urgent at the moment. Um, it, was, it was our top priority pre-COVID and um, it's only made that more important. So, um, yeah, maintenance, um, absolutely as well. I think that's, um, yeah, that's um, and, 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 you know, we've got some tricky questions coming up about street sweeping, for example, <laughs> where we put, all, we put a lot of new curbs in. So um, we've got some new problems to solve. Thanks, Oscar. Um, look forward to hearing how the outcome of all the bike paths and good luck with the um, sweet sweep, uh, street sweepers. Um, the next question is for Nicola. What are the most successful behaviour change strategies you have seen around bike riding? <laughs> um, yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I have to think. <laughs> Look, I... I do, I, we've, we've done a bit of work doing um, skills training, which is definitely um, helpful, getting people to be confident and understanding strategies to ride safely in traffic. But I think what, I think what's really important is then to follow up, like, like for that to, to, there'd be, to be some ongoing, um, whether they then um, meet other people that they ride with. If it's just a, a, a single thing, that they, they come to a workshop or a couple of workshops and then that's all they do, that's less effective than if they then start riding with other people or meet people through that workshop or have ongoing, come on, we run a monthly community ride, that sort of thing. So if there's, if there's sort of follow-up, I think that's more effective than just a, a single um, thing. Um, Gosh, <laughs> I guess it depends what you're what you're trying to trying to do. Um, yeah, um, I, I guess um, our my, my what we what we as I said in my talk, what we're looking at at the moment is um, trying to um, trying to hook into where people are making decisions. It's much harder to 
once you've already entrenched your behavior, once you've already developed a habit of riding to school or driving to school, then it's harder to swap back. That's why we're really going for trying to get people to be able to ride from day one, I guess. Um, I'm not, I don't think I'm answering your question very well, but they're, they're some of the things that, that I, I think we've found have, have um, helped more than others, yeah. Thank you for that, Nicola. Um, so thank you very much to all the speakers tonight. You have delivered an exceptional session. Um, personally, I've learned a lot about public transport and how I could actually make some changes in my life. So for me, the, one of the key takeaway was, you know, I should be thinking about how roads are managed. And I think more importantly too, is how do we have a conversation within the community of how we can influence some changes in the future. And I think being part of the BSG group, this is what we do do well, is how do we get the community involved, engaged and empowered so that we can then move forward and advocate for the things that we look for in the future. And, and especially what's important too, Nicola, which I've taken away, is um, changing behaviours. And once we can change those behaviours, then we can create a different culture in which we hope to live in. So thank you everyone and everyone who's joined us. Um, have a good night. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you so much for facilitating. That was awesome. And thank you so much to all the fantastic speakers. Yeah, well done, uh, Jackie. It was it was great. Really well run. Thank you for inviting Claudia. Um, it, was, it, was, yeah, it, was, it was a real pleasure to be here and I really have learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Crystal. Bye. Thanks, Claudia and Jackie. Thanks for all the wonderful speakers. It was so great. See you later. All right. Thanks for your work. Bye. Thanks, Jackie.